you know, what is so refreshing about our church family spending time together is because our church family is full of people who are born again. It's full of people who are born again. And being born again, you are full of the Holy Spirit. When we're with one another, we are enjoying the fruit of the Holy Spirit being born out in one another's lives. That kind of sweet fruit that the Lord produces in us, especially over time and even especially through trials. Even especially through trials. This evening, we look at Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 36. As Brother Ben just read a few moments ago, This evening, what we want to talk about is learning the lessons of dependence. Learning the lessons of dependence. I will confess to you, I'm going to preach this and I'm going to teach these lessons of dependence. But I am afraid that for many of us, though we are taught the lessons of dependence, we're going to have to learn the lessons of dependence. What I mean by that is this. Many times we are taught truth. We look at God's word, it's rightly divided for us. We hear truth, we receive it, and we say, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And we, we, we know the truth. But we don't really learn it most often until we go through it. And what you see in this passage is that in order to learn the lessons of, dis- of obedience and dependence, the Lord actually crafts scenarios where his people have no choice but to depend. And the reality is, is that the same Lord that dealt with and led Israel is the same Lord that deals with and leads us. And the Lord does, in fact, craft and design in his sovereign providence scenarios where we have no choice but to depend on him. And we may, we may push against him. We may try to manipulate. We may try to forge our own path. We may try to, to gain things by our own um, work ethic, by our own intellect, by our own drive. But many times what we find is that those kinds of things are fruitless. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like a a farmer planting the seed, watering it, and then thinking that it is somehow his responsibility to make it grow. And so he sits there, and with all his heart, he screams at the ground. And he stays up late and he doesn't sleep. He's worried about the seed. He's worried about the growth. And with all his lack of sleep and with all his screaming and all his toiling, he can never do what only God can do. The Apostle Paul describes himself. He says, what what is Paul? What is Apollos? We're servants. This is all we are. He says, I planted. Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. And this is the reality. God makes to grow what he wants to grow. God provides what is perfectly wise, and God provides it in precise, perfect, good, wise timing. We need to learn these lessons of dependence. There's four of them that I see in this passage. Perhaps there's more if you press the... You press the text a little bit harder. I don't even know if we'll have time to get all four of them in tonight, but we're going to make our way through Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 36. When we look at this passage, we come away understanding from this test scenario that the Lord designs, we learn this overarching truth, that my trust in the Lord's provision will be expressed through my obedience to his commands. My trust in the Lord's provision will be expressed through my obedience to his commands. If I truly believe that the Lord will provide for me, 
Here's, here's the way it works. All I do is I concern myself with trusting him and obeying him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. When we quit trusting, we start manipulating. When we quit trusting, we start striving past how hard we ought to strive. When we, when we quit trusting, we get frustrated and irritated and angry, and we do what Israel did so often, and we grumble. We murmur under our breath, Lord, why not? Why not? When, Lord, how much? When are you going to see this need? When are you going to provide? Lord, you know. What are you doing up there? Lord, do you hear me? Lord, will you respond? And we grumble and we murmur. Why? Because we really don't trust that the Lord is faithful to provide. Though we do sing the song and we mean it in our heart, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. But do we truly live that out when we are in need? We live in a society that promotes this, this doctrine of self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, self-reliance. And I'll admit, the Bible does teach that if a man doesn't work, a man doesn't eat. And a man who doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. These are the truths the Bible teaches. But the problem with this doctrine of self-sufficiency is it, it doesn't just teach people that they need to work for their living. They need to make their own money. They need to provide for their own. It tells people that they are sufficient to take care of themselves, that you can provide all that you need if you've just got the grit and the work ethic. You can come by the know-how, but you can make anything of yourself that you want to be. This is a false doctrine. This is a false doctrine. It's the false doctrine of self-sufficiency or even self-dependence. The idea of self-sufficiency, self-dependence, when it really comes down to it, it's delusional idolatry. It is delusional idolatry. When I believe myself to be self-sufficient and self-dependent, I try to put myself in the place of God. This is idolatry. I believe that I can provide for myself. Why do I need to pray to God for my daily bread when I'm going to go and get it and I'm going to hustle and I'm going to make my daily bread? I'm going to get my paycheck and I'm going to buy my groceries and I'm going to take care of myself. This is delusional. It's delusional in, in so many ways. Where did your strength come from? Who do you owe your existence to? Who provided you the job? Who restrains your temper and allows you to keep that job rather than getting fired? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel, right? Who does all these things? God does it. But when I say I keep my job because I prove my work ethic, I prove my worth to this company, to this business, in this role, that's idolatry. That's delusional. Should we work hard? Absolutely. When you work, you work as unto the Lord. You work hard. But you never come to this point, Lord forbid it, that we ever embrace this false doctrine of self-sufficiency and self-dependence. When it comes down to it, we depend on the Lord. Amen. And we need to really just embrace that. Here's what happens. Here's what happens when you reject the doctrine of dependence. Because that's really what we're talking about. It's the lessons of dependence. The doctrine of dependence. When you reject the doctrine of dependence, here's what happens. It always breeds arrogance. When you reject the doctrine of dependence, I depend on God. When you reject that, it breeds arrogance. I take care of myself. I meet my needs. I work really hard. I have a great work ethic. I am smart. I am ingenious. I am an entrepreneur, right? 
That's arrogance. When we reject the doctrine of dependence, it produces arrogance. It also produces workaholism. Workaholism. I have to work and work and work and work all the time. I don't have time to spend reading my Bible. I don't have time to spend with the people of God. I don't really have time to spend the necessary time with my family whom God gave me to be steward of. I come home to go to sleep and I wake up and I go to work because I have to work and I have to make my money. Don't keep me up late. Don't bother me when I get home. And kids grow up without a father. Even though their father's there, he's not there. He's a workaholic. Why? Because he's believing a false doctrine of self-sufficiency, self-dependence. He's rejected the doctrine of dependence. Not only is such a person being arrogant, they're a workaholic, and it also, when you reject this doctrine of dependence, it leads to lawlessness. Lawlessness. I depend on myself and on my own ingenuity. The tendencies of men, the tendencies of human beings, is that the end justifies the means. And if the end is making my money, taking care of my own, excelling and being successful, and it all depends on me, then I'm going to get it however I need to get it. Because what I really need is to provide for myself and be a successful person. And so it breeds lawlessness. All sorts of lawlessness. Cheating the time card. Leaving out early when you're expected to stay. Not giving, not giving full attention so you can focus on something else and get ahead with some side hustle. Cheating taxes. Not being honest. All, all of these sorts of things, what is that? Lawlessness. And surely there are people out there that they believe the ends justify the means and in order to get things, they will rob and steal or do things like that. This is what happens when we reject the doctrine of dependence. When, when we reject this truth that I depend on God for everything. The Lord provides for me. The Lord provides enough for me to live. The Lord provides enough for me to rest. These are these three core truths of the doctrine of dependency. The doctrine of dependence. God provides for me. God provides enough for me to live. God provides enough for me to rest. Now, we run into problems with those, and we'll see how here in just a moment. When we look at Exodus chapter 16, and we are making this application to ourselves, I want to tell you, we're justified in doing so, and in fact, we're commanded to do so. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 6, the Apostle Paul tells us exactly what to do with, with Israel's wilderness wanderings, what they experienced and went through. He says this, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. These are examples recorded for our benefit. We would not desire evil as they did. And what was the evil that they desired? Well, they desired to be self-sufficient. They desired to not depend on God. They were so willing... They were so willing to not depend on God that they actually wanted to go back and become slaves of Pharaoh. Delusional. 
It's madness. When we look at this passage, we see it in two sections. Verses 1 through 30, we see the Lord's provision was designed for obedience. The Lord's provision was designed for obedience, and such it still is today. In verse 31 through 36, we see that the Lord's provision was designed for remembrance. Designed for remembrance. Both of these designs of the Lord's provision still hold true for us. The design in His provision is for our obedience and for our remembrance. Look at the passage with me, the first section, verse 1 through 30. It says, They set out from Elam, and you remember that place. Palm trees all over. They had just come from Mara, where the water was bitter and non potable. It was undrinkable, poisonous. You remember the Lord, the Lord commanded, and Moses, Moses made the water to become sweet, and they all drank and they were happy. But when the water was bitter, man, they were bitter in their soul. They were angry, they were grumbling, they were murmuring against, against Moses and ultimately murmuring against God. You don't see any grumbling, you don't see any murmuring, you don't hear any of these sinful whispers when the people go to Elam because they find themselves in an oasis. And, and there's 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees, and they encamp there. Their flesh is satisfied. Their flesh is happy. So you don't read of any grumbling. Now the Lord in Exodus 16 brings them to a place outside of Elam, now into the wilderness before they get to Mount Sinai. And this is an uninhabitable place. This is a place of death. So they set out from Elam, where all the springs and trees were. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin which is between Elam and Sinai, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, where Moses will receive the law of God. They're not there yet, but they are in the wilderness. On the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now, when I read that in the English, it really doesn't do justice to the way that Moses recorded it in Hebrew. When Moses recorded that in Hebrew, and I've explained this to you before, whenever you want to create a superlative, in English, we normally change the form of the word, right? A superlative is just like this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's just like this. Good, better, best, right? Good, better, best. In Hebrew, you don't do that. In Hebrew, if you want to say it's good, it's this least amount, you say the verb or the adjective, the adverb, once. If you want to make it better, more emphatic, you say it twice. And if you want to make it the most extreme, the most emphatic form of the superlative, you repeat it three times. And it's even stacked upon itself in the Hebrew such that it creates this line. This is the way that it actually reads. Verse 2, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled, grumbled, grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. It has reached a fever pitch. These people are angry. They are furious. And they're mumbling, mumbling, murmuring. They're backbiting. They're cursing Moses behind his back. Moses and Aaron grumble, grumble, grumble against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt? Would that God, would that Yahweh had treated us the way he treated the Egyptians? Would that the Lord had not passed over our houses? Would that the Lord had not applied the blood of the Passover lamb to our little ones? Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Listen to this. When we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It's interesting. After we have been delivered from bondage, it is very interesting how delusional we can become and how forgetful we can become of just how bad that bondage was. 
when you read of Israel's description of their time in bondage, they're sitting around buckets of meat. They're fat. They're happy. They're living life to the fullest. Later on, numbers, they're, they're going to come. We had fresh vegetables. It was great. It was great. When you read the beginning of Exodus, it said the Lord heard their cries and the affliction with which they had been afflicted. The Lord looked upon them. The Lord heard them, and the Lord acted. When they were in bondage, they weren't sitting around meat pots. They were making bricks with no straw. And yet they have now glamorized, while they're on the road with God, they have begun to glamorize their time in bondage because they've hit a little bit of difficulty and they want to seek a little bit of quick comfort and they forget when they were in Egypt, they were slaves. They were the walking dead. And yet now they've been delivered, baptized through the Red Sea, being led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Here's God providing for them. And they say, you know, this road with the Lord is difficult. And it was so much more glamorous. It was so much more glamorous than our previous life. This is madness. This is absolute madness. It's delusional to desire that which God delivered them from. Now, I don't think I have to make a whole lot of deep application here because you and I both know where I'm getting at with this. We tend at times when we're hungry, when we're going through a hard time, when things are a little bit difficult, we have the tendency to glamorize that which the Lord delivered us from And then we get tempted to seek those things out and to behave in that way, don't we? Or am I just talking to myself? I think think I'm talking truth here. We have the tendency to forget just how much of a hell it was and just how much death it produced and just how much disunity it produced. We get delusional because things get a little difficult. Well... The road with the Lord is paved with difficulty, but the road with the Lord is, well, it's just that. It's with the Lord. It's paved with difficulty, but you're with the one who's going to provide. He's going to overcome. He's going to see you through it, and you're going to get to see wondrous things, amazing things. When things get hard, don't glamorize the things that God delivered you from. Don't be tempted to go back to those things and to act that way. Just trust the Lord. The Lord will provide. In this passage, the Lord does that, and they should have been singing, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. But they were glamorizing their past, sitting around the meat pots. Look at verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion. Literally, what can fill their mouth? A day's portion every day. And this is why it's every day. He says, That I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. In other words, the Lord says, I am deliberately putting them in a situation where they have no self-sufficiency, where they are without unless they trust me, and we're going to find out real quick if they believe. We're going to find out real quick if they trust, because if they trust, they'll obey. The truth that we derived out of the previous text we look at is that under the law, there is blessing for obedience and there's cursing for disobedience. And the Lord here has designed a situation we're gonna read about. He's designed a situation where that conditional promise of the law is going to be enacted very quickly and you're going to see it. So the Lord's only going to give them daily bread, not weekly bread, not surplus bread, not 401k bread, not 
Medicare, Medicaid bread, the Lord's going to give them daily bread. Not hard work bread, not self-sufficiency bread. He's going to give them daily bread. Are they going to trust him? It says in verse 5, on the sixth day, when they prepare what to bring in, it will be twice as much, twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. I thought earlier it said that they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. How does the Lord interpret Here's something, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'm going to make the point. Moses and Aaron are leading God's people down God's path according to God's word. The people of God encounter a bit of difficulty on that road of obeying the Lord's leadership through his leadership and through his word. And the people grumble and say, these leaders are bad even though Moses and Aaron were leading according to God's word, they were leading on God's road. How does God interpret such grumbling in such a scenario? He, he decrees it's rebellion. It, it is God's people not grumbling against the leadership he's installed. It's God's people grumbling against him. Why? Well, because Moses and Aaron were hidden behind the word of God. They were hidden behind the word of God. They only did what God said. So who are they representing in their actions? God. They're not stepping outside of God's word, therefore they are protected. And God says when they complain about you leading in God's word on God's path, they're complaining not about you. They're complaining about the Lord. And so the, the Lord says that they've grumbled against him. And so the next day they're going to see his glory. They're going to see his weight, his splendor. They're, they're literally going to see his burden. Glory, kabod, in the Hebrew, it speaks of a burden. It speaks of a weight. That when you are in the presence of glory, there is a weight upon you emanating from that glorious one that presses on you and makes you uncomfortable and yet amazed. And this glory is going to be terrifying because they're going to see that it wasn't Moses who led them out of Egypt. Why are they complaining against him? It wasn't Moses who led them. It was God who led them. Moses says this, verse 6, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? What are we that your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord? You're going to see a miracle, and you're going to see that God's the one leading you. God's the one providing for you. Stop complaining against your leaders when they're behaving in accordance with God's word. That's rebellion. It's not rebellion. It's not discernment. It's rebellion. What are we? That your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, verse 9, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before. Come near is this word, karav, karav. And it has this connotation of come forward to worship. Come offer your sacrifice. Present yourself before the Lord. Aaron says, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they, they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory, the weightiness, the burden of the Lord appeared in the cloud. This cloud that was a comfort to them 
that was providing shade for them during the day, that led them through and guarded them and set a barrier that guarded them all the way through the Red Sea. Now, this same cloud, they would feel the weight, at least a bit of the weight of God, and they would fear. At least they should fear. It says, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. From these first 12 verses, we see the means of the Lord's provision. He says that he's going to provide them both bread and meat. He's going to provide them bread in the morning, meat in the evening. Every day, he's going to give them daily bread. He's going to give them enough to live. This is the first lesson of dependence. The Lord provides for me. It's not Moses. It's not your leadership. It's not your husband. It's not your job. It's not your mother. It's not your parents. The Lord provides for me. This is the whole purpose of this design. And I'll tell you, God puts us in these kinds of situations. God puts us in these situations where you just need the Lord to do something. You need the Lord to provide something because you are without and you have no way to come about those things. You know, the older we get, Brother Eric, the older we get, we seemingly become, or at least we think we become a little more self-sufficient, right? The older we get, the more experience we get in work, the better job we get, the better pay we get, the more time we have to save, the more time we have for interest to accrue. And we tend to forget what it was like when we first got married and we got babies coming in the world. And you, you don't have money to put gas in the car. You don't have money to pay rent. You don't have money to buy food. You're living on deer meat and, and buying 50-cent hamburger helper boxes. These are specific examples, by the way. <laughs> living on deer that you did not shoot, that somebody else shot and prepared, and then you got to eat. Like, those were days of dependency. And man, to see the Lord provide exactly what we need. That song, Blessed Be Your Name, I remember that song being very important in our life I remember it being very important in our life when college was over and we needed a job. And that song was at the forefront of my heart. You know, I remember singing that song. The day, the, the, day, the, day, the, last, the last Wednesday that I had when we were in Lawton, Oklahoma, the worship leader led us in that song. And, and the Lord impressed it on my heart that his provision for us was Hillcrest Baptist Church. He said, blessed be your name. When I'm found in the wilderness, that you, you provide for me. In, in the plenty, in the poverty, Lord, you provide. And the Lord did that. And the Lord opened doors. And the more, Lord made a way for us. And, and he's done that so often. How can we forget that? That the Lord provides for us. When we get to thinking of ourselves as self-sufficient and self-dependent, we tend to forget the, the times where God crafted situations where we had no choice but to depend on him. I remember a particular situation where I, we needed provision, and I walked out of my office, I walked into that sanctuary, and I prostrated myself in the middle of that floor in the darkness in the sanctuary, and I cried out to God. I said, Lord, I need you to provide. And it was a miracle, I tell you. Just a, just a few hours later, the Lord gave us exactly what we needed. How can, how can I forget that? Here's the thing. When we forget that, that the Lord provides for us, you know the Lord's mode of operation usually? It's to create another situation where we've got to depend on him. 
Here's the thing. I, I, I don't want to have to be pressed like that. I would rather just always believe and know that I depend on the Lord. Because hard times are hard times. You learn great lessons, but hard times are hard times, and they're not fun. We have short memories, and we seemingly think sometimes that when we were in need, that we were really sitting around meat pots in Egypt. (laughs) We, We weren't. We weren't at all. We were in need, and the Lord provides. It says in Psalm 34, verse 8 through 10, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Psalm 37, 25. This is how I want to be. The writer says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. The Lord provides. The psalmist says that with great confidence. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. We need to remember that the Lord provides for us. You would do well to write that down somewhere. Just write down that simple truth. The Lord provides for me and pray that the Lord reminds you of that the next time that you are in need or the next time you lean towards arrogance or workaholism or God forbid lawlessness. The Lord provides for me. There's another truth coming out of verses 13 through 21 that the Lord provides enough for me to live. The Lord provides enough for me to live. Look at verse 13. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, Man ha, what is it? That was their response. They looked at it and said, Man ha. What is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. This is how you handle it. Gather of it, each of you, or each one of you, as much as he can eat, as much as he can fit in his mouth. You shall each take an omer. That's about two quarts. That's enough for daily bread. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But then when they measured it with an omer, whoever had gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. You know what kind of bread this is? This is miraculous bread. This is heavenly bread. This is the bread of testing. God gives you enough. And no matter how much you get, it's enough. It's not more than enough. It's never more than enough, but it's always enough. It's never not quite enough. It's just always enough. It's always enough when? When you walked in obedience and you did as the Lord said, what does the Lord give you? enough. He gives you enough. And verse 19, Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Why would they do that? Is it because they were full? No. Because it says that each one had as much as they could eat. They weren't leaving it over until morning because, well, they got full real quick and they had an early lunch and, you know, it's not like that. Why were they leaving some? They were scared, they were distrusting, and they were rationing. They were rationing the food. It says, but they did not listen. Shema, 
They did not listen. They did not hear in order to conform. They did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. It became rotten and rancid and had maggots in it, is what it'll say here in a minute. So what did the Lord do? I tell you, some of us have put, put bread to the test at how long it'll last. It normally lasts longer than a night. It normally takes a long time. Maybe we just have a lot of preservatives in our stuff, but it normally takes a long time for it to become rancid and to breed worms in it. What kind of bread was this? This was heavenly bread. This was the bread of testing, such that the Lord made it where six days out of the week, it would rot overnight. One day out of the week, it would last all the way through the night to the end of the day. This is miraculous bread. This is the bread of testing. And the Lord can control our finances and our provisions in such the same way. Such that, oh, well, I think I've got enough. I think I've got enough. You ever, real, you ever see how when you think you have enough, it never quite is enough? Because we want to plan to say, we want to plan to do this and plan to do this, and something comes up, and what does God do with it? God makes what we were depending on rot. He makes it become rancid. He makes it be used up. The worms eat it. The rot eats it. And Moses was angry. He was incensed with them is what it says at the end of verse 20. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. The Lord designed this bread. It designed this bread to be daily. No matter what, it's going to be daily. It's going to be enough, but you're not going to have enough to become proud of it. You're not going to have enough to build a surplus. You know what happens when we have surplus a lot of times? When we have surplus, we become prideful. When we have surplus, we become greedy. When we have surplus, we tend to be unthankful. But when we're in need, we tend to become lawless. We tend to become angry. We tend to become ugly about it. This is what happens when we go through these times of need. Not realizing, not realizing what God gave you, that's enough. You say, it's not enough. It, it's not enough. It's not enough to make ends meet. Whose fault is that? Maybe there's too many ends to be met. Maybe what we want is more than what we need. And so God provides enough for us to live, but not enough for us to live in luxury and surplus. Maybe the Lord understands what would happen to our hearts if he let us live in luxury. We'd become prideful and arrogant. Maybe the Lord understands that. And so the Lord doesn't let that happen. Maybe that's a grace of God. Maybe that's God saying, look, you want more. You want more than you need. Well, God, I've got a way around that. In fact, our our economy makes it real possible because our economy will issue credit to any breathing thing. In fact, I probably imagine they'd be real democratic about it and even give a credit card to a dead person. Some of you will get that at some point. <laughs> but this is what happens when we, when we have surplus we have need, we become sinful. We're tempted to sin in various ways. Listen to the proverb, Proverbs 30, verse 8 through 9. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty or riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Lord, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You know what Paul figured out? Paul figured out how to be content. Paul figured out the secret of contentment. 
the secret of contentment with the Lord providing enough to live. Not a surplus and not a deficit, but what the Lord provides, it should be enough. It is enough. Listen to how Paul says it. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. It says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In dunamao is the word strengthen. God who instills power, ability, strength, sustenance. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to get through. Abundance, poverty, what is it? It's enough. Whatever the Lord gives is enough when I trust him, when I believe in him. When I don't believe it's enough, that's when I tend to go off the rails and make foolish decisions. That's when I tend to be tempted to do things the Lord has not commanded me to do. Why? Well, I not only have denied that the Lord provides for me, but I've really denied specifically that the Lord provides enough for me to live. Truth number three, the Lord provides enough for me to rest. I hope we all understand that. The Lord provides enough for us to rest. Look at verse 22. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses... He said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept until morning. Well, what's the deal? Why, why are you doing this? This is the problem that the leaders have. They see people gathering twice as much, and they say, well, we're going to get in big trouble here. You're breaking the Lord's commands. We're going to go and talk to Moses about this. On the sixth day, you're gathering twice as much. They go to Moses, and Moses says, well, they're doing what they're supposed to do. The Lord has commanded, gather twice as much on the sixth of the day. What is the Lord doing? Well, the Lord is going to provide enough to live, and the Lord within that provides enough to rest. That's part of how much he provides. But we think that whatever the Lord provides, that that is only for living. This is where we get in trouble. The Lord provides only what I need for living, but the Lord has not provided enough for me to rest. So I have got to work. I've got to continue to press. I've got to continue to push, and I have to work. And there's people all over. There's people all over that constantly, they make a habit of their life to disobey the Lord. And forsake the assembling of God's people. Why? Because they got to work. Got to work. Got to work. They even teach their children this. To disobey the Lord's commands. And they have these kids working for college scholarships when they're 10. Always playing baseball. Always playing soccer. Always playing basketball to get exposure, to get scholarships. And they disobey the Lord trying to get that college scholarship, which is, i.e., money. It is opportunity because it's going to depend on me. They don't believe that God has given them enough to rest, that it's okay. In fact, it's mandated at times, to say, no, I can't work today. No, I will not work today. I will take time to rest. Why? Because God has given me enough, not only to live, God's given me enough to rest. And it was good enough for God to rest. You know where you get the idea, the truth of Sabbath? You get it from Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. That's the first place that you see that in the Bible. The next place that you see it is there in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. You see it described, this, this commandment to Sabbath, to take a rest. 
God has built this in, and in fact, when we do it, we are acknowledging that God himself worked six days to create all things, all things that we enjoy, all things that we need, and on the seventh day, he rested from his work. And so we're acknowledging God's creative work. We're acknowledging God's creative design. We are acknowledging God's provision for us and our trust, our faith in him, not only to give us enough to live, but to give us enough to rest. Continue to to read there. It says, verse 23, and he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all that is left over, left aside, lay aside to be kept until the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day which is a Sabbath, there will be none. You know what this tells me? This tells me if you will trust the Lord to work six days out of the week, trust him. He will make what you earn in six days last for seven. He'll make it last. He will make it work. Well, I don't know. Well, that's a lack of faith. Be honest, that's what that is. I don't know. I don't know. Surely it's going to run out. It's going to breed worms. It's going to, it's going to stink. It's going to run out. I'm not going to have enough. We're not going to have anything to eat. God's not. God says he's going to provide. God says to rest. He gives us what we need. He gives us what we need to live, and he gives us what we actually need to rest. Verse 27, there's people who don't trust, and you know what God does? He doesn't provide for them. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each one of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. You know what that tells me? That tells me when we press so hard that we work every day of the week and we don't rest as the Lord commanded, we believe we're working for seven days a week, but we're only getting paid for six. That's what we're really doing. We're not getting ahead. We're going out and trying to make it work, but it doesn't add up. We'll say, well, that's not good math. Sure it is. Sure it is. That's biblical math. Because you know what God can do with that overtime on Sunday that that we take in order to miss church and and get ahead and be self-dependent? You know what God can do at that point? God can send some worms. God can send some rot. God can send that unexpected bill that seemingly suddenly it just consumed all that we thought that we earned and got ahead. Why did that happen? I don't know the mind of the Lord, but I know the example he provided in Exodus 16. Maybe it happened because we didn't trust the Lord and we thought that we didn't need to rest. Maybe you don't feel like you need to rest, but do you feel like you need to obey? We ought to obey. We do need to rest. How am I going to be provided for? How am I going to get what I need? We need this extra money. Therefore, I tell you, says Jesus, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Verse 34 of the same chapter. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. All these things will be added to you. He says the Gentiles, the unbelievers, they worry. They rot their own heart with worry. But don't you know that you're more valuable to God than the lilies of the field? And yet the flowers of the field are more gorgeously ordained than Solomon in all his splendor. Aren't you more valuable to God than the flowers? You are. So quit worrying. Rest. Relax. I had a man come to me one time, and he said, you know what? We're just really having a hard time 
making it here to church, making it here to show up because I have job opportunities. I have, I have little things that I can do, a side hustle that I can do on Sundays, and it's at the same time. And I even that side hustle is on Wednesday nights, and so I just make it here whenever I'm not asked to work. I'm really bothered by it. What do I need to do? And I told him, I said, do you want me to give you my honest answer here? Yes, absolutely. I said, you need to quit. Stop. Just tell them no. You know the Lord wants you in church. This is a side gig. This is surplus. This is not what you need. You need to quit. And you know what he said? Okay. And he walked outside, got on the phone, and called the people and said, I'm not working on Sundays anymore. I'm not working on Wednesdays. I'm going to be at church. Thanks. And got off the phone. Wow. What a, what a, what a believing man. What an example. I'm not worried about it. The Lord will provide. So the Lord provides for us. He provides enough for us to live every day. He provides enough for us to rest. You know what the Lord also does? The Lord provides for us. He provides for me as a testimony to other people. He provides for me as a testimony to others. God doesn't just provide for me so that I can have. God provides for me for his glory. God provides for me for his glory. So the people are put in this situation to test their obedience. But then the Lord also designs this provision, verses 31 through 36, for remembrance, for glory. It says, Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. When you read the testimony in Numbers chapter 11, verses 7 through 9 about manna, it, it shows us at least three things about this. That the manna was effective. It was nourishing Manna was nourishing. It, it filled them. It took care of their needs for a day. It's nourishing. Here it says like it tastes like wafers, like a thin pastry that's made with honey. It's not only nourishing, it's delicious. We also read in Numbers 11 that it's versatile, that the people would gather this and they would bring it home. They would grind it up. Some of them would just eat it straight. Some of them would bake it. Some of them would take it home and grind it up and mix it together and they would boil it. What are they making? Dumplings. They're making dumplings out in the wilderness. That's exactly what they're doing. They're taking water from a rock and bread from heaven, and they're making quail and dumplings. That's what they're doing. So they've got, they've got a little bit of cornbread to go with it. They got a biscuit. They got some dessert pastry, and they got a pot of quail and dumplings. That's biblical. That's exegesis. <laughs> Amen. Verse 32, Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer, let about 2.1 quarts daily bread, let an omer be kept throughout your generations. Problem, generations last more than a day. And if this is Sabbath bread, generations last more than two days. But you're going to take daily bread, set it aside, and it's going to last for hundreds, thousands of years. And I have no reason to believe that the, the ark of the testimony has been destroyed. That manna is still in that vessel, right next to Aaron's budded staff with the ripe blossoms of almonds on it, right next to the testimony. That stuff still hasn't rotted. Why? That's God's bread. This is God, God, God makes happen with his bread whatever he determines for it to do. It says, keep it throughout your generation so that they may see, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness. Who is they? It's they who are not going to be in the wilderness. They who are not there have no conscious memory of how God provided when they were being born for their parents who were struggling to scratch by. You need to keep a little aside to remind them so that they know. And Moses said to Aaron, verse 33, take a jar, take a vessel and put an omer, put some daily bread, 
an omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony. That is the Ark of the Covenant that carried the testimony, that carried Aaron's staff, that carried the manna. The people of Israel, verse 35, ate the manna 40 years, and they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is a tenth part of an ephah. If you want to read about the end of that 40-year provision, you can go to Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. They get on the border of Canaan. Here's all the fruit and here's all the food. And they're able to go in. The manna stops. This is miracle bread. This is heavenly bread. God provided it as long as they needed it until he provided another way. And even when he provided another way, he provided enough. He provided enough for them to rest enough for their fields to rest, and he provided in such a way that they were to tell other people. They were to tell other people about how God provided. Psalm 78, verse one through four. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might and the wonders that he has done. Don't forget. Don't forget how the Lord provided for you. And not just hold it in remembrance. The point is remembrance for people who weren't there when the Lord did it. That's who's called on to remember it. And how are they going to know unless you tell them? Maybe sometimes, fathers, when we sit down at the dinner table, we need to say, hey, kids, let me tell you about a time. Let mom and I tell you about a time when God provided for us. Let us just tell you something. Share it with them. Remember it. Praise God. And then sit there and sing with your children. Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Tell them. Here's the thing, though. The Lord's provided not just for our physical need. The Lord's provided for our spiritual need. Those in the wilderness, they ate the bread and they died. Every one of them. There is no earthly provision that God gives. No earthly resource that sustains life forever. But there is a person that God has given a heavenly resource that sustains life for all eternity. In fact, the Bible says life was in him and the life was the light of men. You remember in John chapter six, verse 35, Jesus says, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never hunger thirst. Don't just depend on God for daily bread. Depend on God for living bread. The living bread that came down from heaven, as Jesus says. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread that your fathers ate of and died, but the living bread is he who came down from heaven and offered his life up for the world. And whoever comes to me will live forever will have eternal life. And then you can say, when well, the Lord provides for me, the Lord's provided enough for me to live. The Lord's provided enough for me to rest. The Lord provided for me in such a way that I've got to tell other people. It's ultimately, the Lord provided eternal life for me. Pardon for sin and peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. 
Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you always provide for us. You've provided for us through your son, Jesus, who you gave into the world, Lord, to take care of our great need of sin and its consequences for the wages of sin is death. But the provision, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you that you gave him for his body to be broken as bread, for his blood to be poured out like wine, Lord, for us to receive him by faith and to believe and to live forever. Lord, we thank you and we give you praise. Lord, give us the joy, give us the strength and the courage to tell others about this great provision. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and in the power of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen. Amen.